Good afternoon. On behalf of the New York Catholic Center and the Thomistic Institute, I'm happy to welcome everyone here for the conference today. My name is Father Thomas Joseph White, and I'm the director of the Thomistic Institute in Washington, D.C., and we're happy to continue to have so many interesting conferences and events here at NYU. The subject of our reflections today is on the topic of natural rights. What are natural rights? Are there such things? How might they be identified? It's a subject of contestation and uh, an opportunity for a wonderful kind of engagement between many extremely qualified speakers who we have lined up for today. If I can introduce the first of our speakers, it's our pleasure to have Professor Nigel Bigger here. Professor Bigger is the Regis Professor of Moral and Pastoral Theology at the University of Oxford in Christ Church, and he's director of the McDonald Center for Theology, Ethics, and Public Life. He has previously, before taking up this post, taught also at the University of Leeds and Trinity College Dublin. Professor Bigger read modern history at Wor Worcester College, Oxford, and uh, went on to study religion, theology, and ethics in Canada and the USA. He did his doctorate at the University of Chicago. He has been a very prolific uh, ethicist. He has um, published a number of important works, including um, In Defense of War. It's a major book on the just war tradition from Oxford University Press in 2014. Uh, back in 1996, he published The Hastening That Waits, an important book on Karl Barth's ethics. He's got a book um, called Between Kin and Cosmo uh, uh, Cosmopolis, An Ethic of the Nation, on the significance of um, nation states and national ethics. Of course, a very timely topic from 2014. He's currently working on a book called What's Wrong with Rights? I would like you to help me um, welcome Professor Bigger and thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Father Joseph Thomas, for the uh, warm introduction and thanks for the invitation to come and join you this afternoon. Um, as uh, Father Joseph Thomas had said, I, I'm, I'm in the process of writing a book. Um, called uh, What's Wrong With Rights. I should add that there's a question mark at the end of that title. What's Wrong With Rights? It is a question. Um, so what that means is that what I'm going to give you this afternoon, um, well, there's good news and there's bad news. Um, the good news is that what I'm giving you is, is work in progress, and that means that uh, you can help shape what I'm thinking, because I haven't finished thinking yet. Uh, the bad news is that um, because I've had my, 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 my face very close to the trees in recent weeks, um, I might be giving you more detail than you really want or need. Uh, I apologize for that, but I'm in the process of trying to stand back and make sense of what I've been reading. So what we are uh, focusing on uh, this afternoon is the issue of natural rights. And let me make clear uh, that our issue is not primarily about positive legal rights. Uh, positive legal rights are those uh, that are granted under a particular legal system in a given uh, civil society. Um, natural rights are, are outside of a legal system. Uh, they are pre-social or extra-social. Um, and it's, uh, they, they exist prior to social institutions um, in a primitive state of nature or apart from them in a state of anarchy or war. At least that's how I understand them. And I'm focusing on those. In some discussion, the two are confused and it's not helpful. So my concern is unambiguously with natural rights. Why am I concerned? I'm concerned because there is a consistent tradition of criticism of natural rights talk, which runs at least from the late 18th century to the 21st. At the beginning of this tradition stands Edmund Burke, and shortly afterwards comes Jeremy Bentham, who famously declared, natural rights is simple nonsense, natural and imprescriptible rights rhetorical nonsense, <laughs> okay, so, so you've heard what uh, Jeremy Bentham famously said, natural rights, nonsense upon stilts. Uh, just over ten years ago, the eminent Kantian philosopher Honora O'Neill opened her article 
the dark side of human rights with a quotation by Burke. So we have a tradition of scepticism running from the late 18th century at least until 10 years ago. And it remains uh, alive and very much kicking. And it counts in its ranks some very eminent philosophers. Therefore, I think we need to pay attention. And that's why I'm concerned. Now, in the course of the next uh, uh, 35 minutes or so, uh, I can't possibly consider the whole of, the, of this tradition. Uh, but I will limit myself to one late 19th century expression of it, uh, namely um, the Scottish moral philosopher David Ritchie. Uh, I'm confident you've never heard of Ritchie. Uh, he was, uh, as I say, born in Scotland. He lived for a brief 50 years between 1853 and 1903. He taught at both Oxford and St Andrews. And he's much less well known than uh, Burke, Bentham, or O'Neill. Nevertheless, his 1895 critique, Natural Rights, a criticism of some political and ethical conceptions, continues to be cited by specialists, and it deserves to be recovered from general oblivion. Um, partly because it is substantial in content, but also because it is also amusingly ironic in style. And let me assure you, if ever you are compelled to work your way through dense tomes and articles by philosophers on, uh, uh, on rights, uh, the opportunities for chuckling are quite rare. <laughs> uh, David Ritchie will give you some of the rare ones. After reporting to you what uh, Ritchie says, um, uh, the time remaining won't permit me to uh, make a comprehensive test against 800 years of natural rights talk from the 12th century to the 21st. So instead, what I'll do is I will test what he says against the concept of natural rights as they first began to appear in the late medieval and early modern periods. <clears throat> so, first of all, what does David Ritchie have to say in critique of natural rights? Well, with Burke and Bentham, he shares a basic objection to the abstract nature of natural rights. He comments, abstract thinking is the habit of taking up a formula which may be true enough in its context, isolating it from the surroundings that made it valuable and carrying it out regardless of consequences. So instead of vague and rhetorical appeals to the law of nature, we can only allow natural rights to be talked about in the sense in which natural rights mean those legal or customary rights which we have come to think it most advantageous to recognize. In other words, natural rights discourse as a way of talking about positive rights that are morally justified, all things considered, might be acceptable. But natural rights as absolute, lacking information by social exigency and qualification by social circumstance, and so obtaining universally, always and everywhere, do not exist. For example, there is no general, unconditional, natural right to life. And here I quote, whether preservation of life is to be guaranteed or not must surely depend on whether the life is valuable to the society or injurious to it, or whether, though not valuable, or even to some extent injurious, other considerations of general security, etc., make it expedient to give the preservation of such life the support of the organized force of the community. End of quote. To sharpen his point, he adds the ironic observation that, and I quote, the principle that there is an inalienable right in all men to preserve their lives, however much social utility may demand the sacrifice of some, would lead to a rapid disappearance of the civilized men who adopted such a principle before barbarians who didn't. However, it is with regard to property that, according to Ritchie, the confusions which permeate the theory of natural rights come out most conspicuously of all. What appears to be a natural right to property, according to Locke, is actually the first occupier's natural right to own the best, leaving what remains to those who follow. It cannot mean the equal right of everybody to ownership of the best, for that, 
Richley Riley tells us, would result in a vast amount of natural litigation, that's to say, fighting. The justification of the property right of the first occupier therefore lies in its social convenience. It avoids anarchy. It is natural only in the sense of being all social things considered morally justified. The truth is that we can't know what a natural right to property means or whether it exists without knowing what it implies and under what conditions. As he writes, what objects may be held as property? Can we hold slaves, for example? And how far does the right over these objects extend? Is it a right merely to use or a right to use up? Is it a right to destroy or to alienate? To answer these questions is to specify the right in terms of certain conditions. However, what is contingent upon conditions is no longer natural in the sense of being absolute, holding always and everywhere. For example, he reports the 1858 Kansas Bill of Rights claimed, in unqualified terms, that each individual's right of property in and control of his person is natural and inalienable. Presumably, he observes, this does not apply to convicted felon. Further, notwithstanding the appearance of absoluteness in its initial affirmation of a natural right to property, the French Declaration of 1793, in fact, makes it subject to public necessity. Similarly, the US Constitution's upfront affirmation is later qualified by the Fifth Amendment, which allows that private property may be taken for public use, albeit not, quote, without just compensation. What this last qualification amounts to, comments Ritchie, will depend upon the state of public opinion at any given time. In both the French and the US cases, in other words, the opening rhetoric of unconditional natural rights is effectively undermined by subsequent and inevitable qualifications. Now, as it happens, Ritchie's point here exactly anticipates that made by NYU's own Jeremy Waldron just over 100 years later. Waldron observes, or did, did observe at least 30 years ago, that the French Declaration does in fact subject natural rights to exceptions and limitations, but only in the latter parts of the document, quote, where they would not detract too much from the appearance of absolutism so far as the particular rights were concerned. Further, where, where the qualifications are revealed, they are inevitably cast in language so vague as to undermine any force, let alone any absolute force, that the initial claims may have had." End of quote. Of all the purported natural rights, that of obtaining happiness is the most absurd in its, in its utopian detachment from practical contingency. As Ritchie puts it, his eyes twinkling, the right not merely of pursuing, but of obtaining happiness, which is named as one of the natural rights of man in most American state constitutions, may seem in this world of ours to be a very large order on the bank of providence. Incidentally, I've no idea. Uh, he was writing in 1895. Did most American state constitutions affirm the right to obtain happiness? I find that incredible. He thought so. OK. Pursue. Pursue. No, pursue is fine, but obtain is a rather large order on the Bank of Providence. OK. I guess we have to go back and check. He appears to have read some of them because he quotes them. In other words, uh, what he's saying here is, one person's right implies another person's obligation. And since ought implies can, another's obligation implies his capability. So. If everyone has a natural right to obtain happiness, someone must be capable of supplying it to everyone and obliged to do so. But who could that possibly be, short of God Almighty himself? It will be clear now, I hope, that Ritchie has no quarrel with positive legal rights which are framed and granted in the light of social exigencies and circumstances. In his eyes, the main drawback of theories of natural rights is that they assume that we can formulate rights irrespective of and prior to any consideration of society. Therefore, he says, it's been my chief endeavor to show that particular practical solutions cannot be given a priori, but must depend on time, 
place and circumstances. Ritchie appreciates that appeals to the law of nature or to natural rights can be charitably understood as criticisms of existing conventions and authorities. And I quote, the real significance of the appeal to nature is, in the first place, the negative element in the appeal. It is an appeal against authorities that had lost their sacredness, against institutions that had outlived their usefulness. It is a convenient form of criticism rather than a good basis for construction. Nevertheless, the formulation of moral and political criticism in terms of natural rights, rather than of natural right or morality, has the unhappy effect of conflating morality with legality. The gravest objection to the whole theory of natural rights is, he says, that it is always tending to confuse the two sets of notions by representing what may on occasion be moral duties as legal or quasi-legal rights. So, for example, talk about a constitutional right to rebel is anarchical, he says, and contradictory. When allegiance to the Pope is thrown off, although morally resistance may seem perfectly justifiable and necessary, the appearance of legality has altogether disappeared. Consequently, disobedience to the law of the land can never be a legal or constitutional right, although it may be morally excused, or it may be in moral duty. So, to sum up David Ritchie's objections to natural rights talk, here are, here are the four points I've gleaned. First, he objects that such talk asserts something abstract and unspecified, whose meaning is consequently vague and uncertain. Second, it asserts something absolute, obtaining always and everywhere, regardless of consequences. Whereas if rights are to be intelligible and practicable, and if they're not to undermine the very society that sustain them, they have to take into account considerations of social good in the circumstances that prevail. And in fact, the misleadingly absolutist rhetoric of natural rights often disguises something far more specific and conditional, as Jeremy Waldron has observed more recently. Third, where it claims, that what, where it claims what no one can provide and is therefore obliged to provide, natural rights talk becomes merely aspirational and this, in fact, is one of Honora O'Neill's main objections. As she puts it, there cannot be a claim, of, claim to rights that are rights against nobody, or nobody in particular. If we take rights seriously and see them as normative rather than aspirational, we must take obligations seriously. If, on the other hand, we opt for a merely aspirational view, the costs are high. For then we would have to accept that where human rights are unmet, there is no breach of obligation, nobody at fault, nobody who can, who can be held to account, nobody to blame, and nobody who owes redress. We would in effect have to accept that human rights claims are not real claims. Ritchie's fourth and final objection is that natural rights talk tends to confuse moral claims with legal ones. So, now I've distilled Ritchie's main objections to natural rights talk. And I should say, I've mentioned Walden, I've mentioned O'Neill. Uh, much of what he says um, was anticipated by both Burke and Bentham. So there is a coherence to this continuous stream of, of criticism. So what I want to do now is to take those criticisms and run them through uh, my, my uh, reading of the development of natural rights talk in the late medieval and early modern periods. That's what I'll do next, and then I'll summarize at the end. A seminal moment in the articulation of a concept of a natural right was the 14th century Franciscan controversy about the status of private property. In 1321, Pope John XXII launched an attack on the Franciscan doctrine of absolute apostolic poverty which held that the renunciation of all property rights was essential to the teaching of Christ and his apostles, and so to evangelical perfection. Quite what caused the Pope to make this attack is not clear. Concern about the subversive implications for church property and authority seems likely. Whatever the cause, the effect was his development of an argument 
that private property is natural. Pope John argued that a right to use something does not confer, confer the right to destroy or consume it. Only a right of ownership confers that. Therefore, insofar as the Franciscans consume food justly, they own property and they have a right to it. As with the Franciscans, so with Adam in the state of original innocence. He had dominium or ownership over temporal things, and so he had the right to consume them. And he had this right even when there was no one else to exchange commodities with. Therefore, the right to private property is natural. And it's natural in the sense of being primordial and ideal, not merely in the sense of being a reasonable, morally justified, pacifying way of responding to the conflict engendered by sin. Whatever his motives, in asserting the natural right to property as primordial and ideal, Pope John went counter to the whole tenor of the canonistic tradition that he had inherited. Inspired by the common ownership of goods in the early church, as recorded in the Acts of the Apostles, this tradition shared with some early fathers a suspicion of and even hostility towards the very notion of private property. Thus St. Ambrose, no one may call his own what is common, of which if a man takes more than he needs, it is obtained by violence. According to this view, private property is not natural in the sense of primordial or ideal. Rather, as the 13th century canon lawyer Huguccio put it, it is a social convention justified as a prophylactic against the sins of covetousness and avarice. This tradition of a morally conditional affirmation of private property was represented against the Pope by William of Ockham, who argued that Adam's original dominion, dominion was granted not just for himself, but for the sake of Eve and their progeny too. That's to say, it was a natural, inalienable, morally justified power of using commodities as necessary to meet common needs. It was not a natural right to own property. After the fall and in the condition of sin, however, reason dictated that it was expedient for individuals to appropriate things to themselves. Only then, therefore, did a right to private property arise through social contracts enforceable by judicial institutions. To put the matter in, in David Ritchie's terms, the positive, legally established right to private property is morally justified by its social convenience. It prevents anarchy. It is not natural in the sense of ideal, but is a morally reasonable institution necessary for peaceful social life. Now, I can't uh, claim at this point to have mastered what is at stake conceptually in this dispute like, um, well, I can report that the, the dispute is very confusing because different people arguing about the same things use the same terms in different ways. It's, it's quite complicated. But one thing is this. In combating the claim that the right to private property is natural in the sense of primordial, Ockham is defending the Ambrosian idea that the right of ownership is conditional. It is not the first or last word. It is not morally absolute. While we may have a positive legal right to own something, and while that right is morally justified, it still remains subject to the moral obligation to use one's private property for the common good seems to me that anyone who believes in some kind of natural or objective moral order, as Christians and other moral realists do, should side with Ockham here and say that the right to private property is not natural in the sense of being morally absolute. However, there is a second sense in which we might say that such a right is natural, and as will become clear implicitly, I'll make it explicit, a lot hangs in this debate as what you mean by natural, so different, different meanings are at play which is why it's confusing. There's a second sense in which we might say that such a right is natural, insofar as natural means reasonable or justified in terms of natural moral law, whether as a means of social order or of curbing sin, we could say that the right to private property is natural. However, we had better not, since as Ritchie alerts us, such talk could confuse. This is because I think, I think the paradigm of a right is positive and legal. And talk of having a right 
connotes a possession that, thanks to the institutions of civil society, is relatively fixed and stable. Whereas the conditions of, uncivilized, of the uncivilized state of nature before or outside of, se of settled society are not stable. So to talk of a natural right to property risks implying a stability of ownership outside of civil society that simply doesn't exist. I'll make that point again later. The medieval debate about the moral status of private property gave rise to the claim, or at least the implication, that an owner has a natural absolute right to it. It also gave rise to the opposite claim, that those in extreme need have a natural right to help themselves to such private property as is surplus to the needs of its owner. Thomas Aquinas famously wrote that indigents, that's to say those in extreme need, would not be committing theft by helping themselves to such a surplus, that they would be morally justified or right in doing so. But Aquinas refrained from ascribing to them the possession of a, of a right to do so. So what he says is, in certain circumstances, it would be right for the indigent to avail themselves of the surplus of someone's property. He doesn't say that they have a right. Okay. This is actually a, 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 a crucial point in, 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 in my argument. So um, it's, perfectly, it's perfectly okay to say that whether in civil society or outside of civil society, in a certain situation, according to natural moral law, it is right, it is just that something. That's fine. It is different to say in a state of nature that one has or possesses a right. What's the difference? The latter, I, I think, implies that, that possession means that this is fixed and stable, that I have this. Whereas, in fact, in the state of, of uh, nature, the circumstances change and the morality of the situation changes more rapidly than in civil society. So I think it's unwise to talk about uh, a natural right for that reason. It implies a kind of legal fixity and stability that doesn't exist. We can discuss that later if that doesn't make sense to you. So, so Aquinas didn't ascribe a right to, uh, 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 to, to take um, from another surplus, although he did say it could be right. However, another 13th century canonist, Hostiensis, didn't refrain. He wrote that, and I quote, one who suffers the need of hunger seems to use his right in taking from another surplus rather than to plan a theft. And three centuries later, Hugo Grotius wrote in similar terms that in cases of extreme necessity, the original natural right of the equitable use of common property revives. Now again, the problem with such talk is the one that Ritchie identified. It confuses the legal with the moral. First, talk of a right, a right, connotes a legal entity. Well, what's being talked about here is not, it's moral. What's more, in the case of taking what's needed from someone else's property, it is illegal. So in this case, what Aquinas is saying is, it might be moral for um, someone in extreme need to take from someone else's private property when they have more than enough. But of course, in so doing, it's illegal, according to, to civil law, but it's moral. So it's confusing to call it a moral right, or a natural right. Second, a right connotes something stable and enduring, whereas what's being talked about here comes and goes according to the happenstance of indigence and surplus. So rather than talk about the indigent possessing a natural right to surplus private property, it would, I think, be less misleading to say that in circumstances, it is morally right or just for the indigent to avail themselves of private property's owner's surplus. <coughs> OK, so far, uh, my analysis of late medieval and early modern talk of natural rights has revealed two problems. The implication that a natural right is absolute and impervious to higher moral claims, in some cases, and the danger of misleading us into assuming that what happens to be right according to natural morality in a state of nature has the same kind of fixity and stability as a positive legal right. So those are two problems. And here's a third. This arises in relation to a set of natural rights asserted by Vittoria in the 1530s. 
in his treatise um, about the Indians or the Indies, he wrote that the law of nations, which is or derives from the natural law, confers on everyone a right to travel freely, to trade, to be treated equally with other strangers, and to acquire citizenship. Such rights are presented as universal and unconditional. Upon reflection, however, it appears that there are many circumstances where, arguably, someone ought not to have such freedom, equality of treatment, or benefit of citizenship. Therefore, at least these natural rights need to be specified. But to specify them is to define them in relation to various circumstances so that they apply under these conditions, not those. In other words, to specify them is to strip them of their universal and absolute quality. Nevertheless, perhaps, it still makes sense to talk of individuals having a natural right rather than something being morally right according to the law of nature, perhaps. Maybe natural rights talk makes sense because it makes a presumption in favour of liberty and equality and places the burden of proof on those who would make exceptions. That's to say that everyone should have the freedom to travel um, um, unless it is proven that they shouldn't. So there's a presumption in favour of uh, freedom of travel. Well, it seems to me that such presumption might have made sense in the 16th century when large tracts of the globe were no man's land, not having been brought under the control of, of any settled society, where borders were porous and where there were no passports. But it's no longer, uh, um, um, it no longer makes sense now when almost all the world is divided into nation states with monitored borders controlled immigration, and conditional citizenship. If a natural right to freedom of travel ever did exist, then time and circumstance have since done away with it, in which case it was never really natural at all. Now at this point, just, just to save time, because I do want a chance to have time for questions and answers uh, or discussion. Uh, the, the next session I was going to talk about um, uh, different concepts of a right to liberty and basically there are two in the early modern period. Uh, there is one that um, derives from um, uh, classical Roman sources which is the one that is picked up by the Renaissance and you find in Thomas Hobbes the notion that originally um, um, uh, right at the beginning of, of human history and ideally um, human beings have an absolute liberty an absolute liberty uh, nothing not even moral law constrains so this liberty is absolute uh, there is no moral law uh, at the beginning um, according to Thomas Hobbes um, there is um, this absolute liberty and, and only when you enter into social contracts does natural law or moral law arise and moral law is basically uh, the servant of uh, the individual self-interested um, um, engagement with, with society. Uh, that view, um, as I say, derives from the likes of Cicero through the Renaissance in, into Hobbes and then into uh, modern libertarian thinking. And it's quite different from um, uh, the view that you find in scholastic thinking, which I think is properly Christian and is morally realist, the notion that um, even in the state of nature, um, the, the natural moral law applies even in the state of nature uh, 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 there is no there, there's never any, any human freedom that is as it were free of the obligations of natural moral law um, I'll spare you the details on that um, then, I then I go on to say that um, um, Quite apart from uh, the uh, classical Renaissance Hobbesian notion of, uh, of liberty, you do find in the late, mo late medieval period scholastic theologians beginning to develop a notion of political liberty. Um, so, for example, Ockham, who uh, has been reckoned to produce the, the um, first essentially rights-based treatise on political theory, Ockham argued that the abuse of power by the Pope is opposed, and I quote, to the rights and liberties granted by God and nature. Now, in fact, 
Um, most of Ockham's argument doesn't proceed in terms of nature at all. It proceeds in terms of Christian liberty. Because, of course, he's, he's talking in the context of Christendom and a Christian church. And so he appeals to Pauline notions of Christian liberty uh, uh, in order to establish, um, in order to, to, to ground uh, and defend positive legal rights against papal incursion. Um, but although it doesn't come to the fore in the late medieval period, there is latent in Christian arguments about political liberty a different kind of argument based on nature. And this comes to the fore when, in the uh, 1500s, scholastic thinkers turned to consider not the case of Christians within Christendom, the case of non-Christian infidels in the, uh, um, in the Caribbean, so the, the case of, of Amerindian infidels, when, of course, the, the issue of Christian liberty uh, can't be appealed to to, to ground uh, an argument for their political freedom. And here what you find is that the scholastics like uh, uh, Vittoria uh, appeal to, not to Christian liberty, but to um, the rational, morally responsible nature of all human creatures, insofar as this has not been eradicated by sin. So in 1550, uh, Bartol Bartolome Bartolomeo de las Casas uh, said, and I quote, as regards humans, from the beginning of their rational nature they were born free, for liberty is a right necessarily instilled in man from the beginning of rational nature and so from natural law. So in this period we find two concepts of a natural right to liberty. The humanist one is a natural right to an original liberty in a state of nature unconstrained by any moral law at all. Um, the other one is the scholastic argument in favour of a natural right to liberty, uh, which in involves a claim that this is proper to the nature of human beings as rational, as capable of creative thought and moral responsibility. And uh, the claim goes that all humans everywhere, as such, deserve to have that freedom respected. Now, th just to make clear, this is a point where I, I, I'm not decided yet, but th this could be uh, um, a a good and fruitful ground for the, for the building of some plausible notion of natural right. I'm not sure about that. I do observe that although David Ritchie is overwhelmingly critical of natural rights, um, on this point he appears to uh, concede, and that may be significant. So he concedes a, con a concept of natural rights generated by the requirements of respect for the nature of human individuals. He doesn't do so in Thomistic terms, he does so in terms of Kant and Hegel, he thinks of the individual self as, and I quote, the imperfect realization of a universal reason, one and indivisible throughout the universe, though manifested in countless forms and revealed most clearly to us in the work of the human spirit. Thus, because he potentially shares in this consciousness of the universal reason, the individual may claim the opportunity of developing this potentiality as far as possible. So, I note it is significant that this... Um, relentless critic of natural rights concedes this point, um, and uh, I will reflect further on that. However, despite his concession, I also observe that R Ritchie remains silent about precisely what claims an individual human being's rationality generates always and everywhere, and quite what positive legal rights it should ground. So even if we concede that human beings as rational and there are many debates to be had about what that means. Even if we can see that that gr should ground certain kinds of just behavior, and if we want to talk about that in terms of uh, natural rights, the question of what that means in, in practice is unclear at this point. If it does generate, and here's one obvious uh, possibility, if it does generate claims to liberty of thought and expression, so human beings being rational individuals, uh, we have a certain freedom of thought and a, a certain uh, room for uh, uh, moral discretion, so that could ground uh, natural rights or some claim to liberty of, uh, of speech and expression. That's possible. Richie says, if that's so, um, it doesn't uh, amount to um, um, the granting of unconditional natural rights to freedom, as he comments. If anyone supposes that for liberty as such, there is any a priori justification as against the claims of restraint as such, or interference as such, he becomes prey to the old fallacy which consists in taking relative terms as absolute. 
whether the negative liberty of being let alone is good or bad depends on what occasions, in what places, and by whom. And then he, he gives the example of um, the, the so-called right to equal free speech. And he says, outside of a particular society or association and its particular social rules, it doesn't exi exist. I quote, any absolute claim of equal freedom on the part of every individual could only mean the breakup of the society. For that reason, there are no natural rights of bores and buffoons. To avoid anarchy, therefore, the liberty of free expression of opinion has to be restricted. In determining what those restrictions should be, however, appeal to the principle of natural rights is no help at all. Rather, we must look to the requirements of social order, which will vary according to time and place. And then, uh, mischievously, perhaps provocatively, Ritchie suggests that sometimes a strong despotism is better able than a free government to grant a right to freedom of expression because it is better able to contain the resultant conflict. So to conclude, how telling is David Ritchie's critique of natural rights against the late medieval and early modern traditions? Sometimes the authors I've reviewed do assert abstract and unspecified natural rights whose meaning is consequently indefinite and implausible and whose obligates, that's to say, and those whom they oblige, who they are, is uncertain. And often the authors do conflate the legal and the moral, wrongly implying that what is right according to natural morality in a state of nature enjoys the fixity and stability characteristic of a right according to civil law. In his critique, Ritchie was reacting mainly against late 18th century and early 19th century American and French declarations of human or natural rights. He was not responding to Hobbes' alleged natural right to original, amoral, absolute liberty, nor to the implicit absoluteness of Pope, Pope John XXII's natural right to property. Had Ritchie responded to them, he would, have, he would have joined other moral realists in ruling against them, because he certainly believed in a morality that is not at base, simply the instrument of the individual's amoral drive to survive. So in sum then, I think that Ritchie's critique stands, and with it, much natural rights talk of the late medieval and early modern period fails. Nevertheless, it is significant that even a critic such as Ritchie joins the early modern scholastics in arguing that the rational nature of human beings does generate some moral claims. Quite what these are, he doesn't say. But whatever they are, he would caution us against calling them natural rights, lest we wrongly suppose that their practicable meaning can be determined apart from social and historical circumstance. So in the light of this discussion, and uh, as of last Wednesday, uh, my own provisional position is as follows. There is natural morality that obtains outside of civil society. There are positive legal rights which are specified, not least by identifying those whom they oblige, and these legal rights might well be justified by natural morality. Nevertheless, I think it best not to call these natural rights, lest we think that they obtain outside of civil society with the same fixity and stability. They don't. So as of this moment, I'm not inclined to believe in natural rights. Thanks very much. We have about 10 minutes. Or right. So we have 10 or 15 minutes for uh, questions and answers, and I think Professor Bigger will take his own. Yep. Um, so one and two, please. I'm interested in what you said about surplus property and Aquinas. Yes. And you said that the poor man who takes the surplus property doesn't really have a right. Okay. And and what I'm, I'm curious about is, doesn't the kind of say in one of the replies, though, that uh, what we would call the legal owner who withholds from his surplus is actually guilty of theft? He says the theft yeah. isn't occurring you know, from the poor man, but you know, the rich man who withholds you know, with the surplus, he's actually committing uh, an act of theft. And if that's the case, 
doesn't it seem that perhaps, you know, the <coughs> poor man does have a right, not so much to surplus property, but to basic sustenance from the earth, which you know, connects to the earlier parts. Thank you. Um, so when the kind of says that uh, it, if someone with surplus withholds from their surplus what someone extremely needs, that is an act of theft. You talk about moral theft. I mean, in, in law, it's probably theft. I mean, if you think about if if, 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 if someone were to suppose you have surplus property and someone were to walk in and take it, in the eyes of the law, it would be theft. So so quite 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 meant theft morally. Right, but morally doesn't that mean then that the poor man does have a moral right? Well, that, well, all I, all I observe is that's not the way he put it. He, he, he would talk about in terms of it, um, he would say that it was just that, it was just or right that the poor man took it. He did not say the poor man had a right, possessed a right. So, and that's the distinction I'm making. Now, it may be, this is a difference. Sorry? It's a semantic. Can you repeat it? Can you repeat that phrase? Okay, so it's, it's, it's the same point. So the question, the question is whether anything significant hangs on the fact that the point has said that the, the poor man, that it, in those circumstances, it is morally right that the poor man should take and that the rich man should give. He did not say the poor man had a right. Now, he might have, he might have withheld himself of saying that because in his, in his, in his mind, to have a right was a, a legal thing, and clearly the, the poor man doesn't have a right in a legal sense. He didn't say that the, the poor man had a moral right. Now, um, one can only speculate as to why he didn't. Hostiensis did say that. He said he talked about the poor man. Uh, uh, talked about, about the poor man's. Um, he referred to uh, uh, um, the poor man uh, uh, um, using his right. So were you right? Now, it, it, it may be this. It might be there's a purely semantic difference. The only, the, the important right attached to it is, uh, is over, um, it seems to me a legal right gives a certain stability and fixity. I mean, most legal rights are qualified, they're not absolute, but it gives a certain uh, 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 fixity and stability uh, to, to an individual that in the state of nature, without civil social institutions, you don't have. Uh, that's my understanding. But uh, there are other questions. If you don't mind. So yeah. you start, and, and then you, and then you, and then you. If you can <laughs> keep your. Which is yeah. which is higher, a moral right or a legal right? Uh, from my point of view, a moral right. Natural law is high. So so there can, there can be the law can be unjust. So it is yeah. right for the indigent to pay. It is morally right. The problem is that the, the way we talk about you, the, the very words you use can confuse us that it is morally right, even though it might be illegal. So I think, uh, yes, you, sir, and then, um, yeah, please. Did, did Burke believe that one of the reasons why the French Revolution uh, led to so much anarchy and violence was, was because there was some appeal to some concept of natural rights? Oh, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, both he and Benton were fiercely critical of the abstraction. <coughs> they felt warranted or, or legitimized the wholesale destruction of a whole social and legal system, uh, and ironically resulted in tyranny. Um, so so the, the, they were critical of rights talk as a kind of political, revolutionary political rhetoric. Uh, whereas, as you know, Burke was not against reform, but he, he felt that the most beneficial reform is, is gradual and partial, not wholesale. But, but yeah, he had a sympathy for the American Revolution. Yeah, he certainly absolutely right. Absolutely right. to natural rights there. Well, uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not a Burkean scholar. My, my understanding is uh, uh, Burke was very happy with, as it were, um, rights, um, positive legal rights acquired over history and by constitutional means, which are always quite hedged in and qualified. And, and his defense of the American colonists was that they were, they were um, uh, correctly- and Englishmen and all that kind of thing. They were fighting their inherited rights, yeah. for their inherited rights. Yeah. Um, um, but, but the French Revolution was quite different. Please. Um, it seems that, um, you come down
we don't have the subjective affordable rights, like rights that are stable <coughs> in the state of nature, or perhaps the state of nature, outside of civil society, mm -hmm. in the way that natural moral law is stable and not going anywhere outside of civil society. We do have natural moral law that is stable in that way. Yeah. Um, and then you've also got it, it seems to me when people are looking for something like subjective rights, what they're looking for is a thing that's not just natural law, but the, the thing they need that's stable and, and applies whether I'm here or in Russia or in failed states. And it seems to me that, I mean, what, what we have to be talking about that is sort of like subjective rights-ish is human nature that I carry around with me no matter what. And then the thing that that goes with that, which is like my duty to fulfill my human nature. And so if I have a duty to fulfill my nature in these various ways, and probably also my, my role, that's what I carry around with me, the, the equivalent of the external moral law um, <coughs> that applies in outside of civil society. And so it's not quite subjective rights. But it seems like there's kind of there's a thing in me yeah. that might be what people are trying to get at with that that you might still be able to have. Yeah, so that, that's where I, I ended. There's this notion that um, that there there is something characteristic of all human beings, regardless of where they are, that, that, that requires uh, um, um, the, 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 these qualities that require or oblige a certain respect and a certain kind of treatment, no matter who you are or where you are. That uh, I'm, I'm happy with. Uh, I'm just so, so I'm unsure of the reasons I've explained. I think about whether I'm mean, happy with saying it is right that or just that in these circumstances this human being should be treated this way. Um, I'm a little more nervous about specific formulating that in terms of their having <coughs> natural rights. Be I guess because I think um, that uh, there may be very different sort of circumstances. Where you've got to be careful about assuming that, let's say, what makes sense in a, in a stable, well ordered, wealthy society such as yours and mine, that makes sense in a, in a society with a, with a failed state where security is far more important. Um, uh, it doesn't mean that freedom, freedom is not important, but it means that the kinds of things we assume as natural are not actually, that they, they, they depend on our circumstances more. So I, I, I don't want to contradict what you're saying. Uh, I'm just expressing my reservations about um, about formulating that in terms of natural rights and, and whether our formulation reflects our own situation in ways that will not do prudent justice to other situations. That's my concern. I think I, I think I'd go from, from there to there to there, so maybe to there. Maybe to there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, could you try to explain Richie's third critique of natural law? So this is where Richie and, and Honora O'Neill come quite close. So Richie, he recognizes in the sense that that natural rights rhetoric has a kind of, it's politically mobilizing. You know, if, if you want to mobilize people against the status quo and current institutions, then, well, you could appeal to natural morality, but you can, you can you, maybe as a kind of shorthand, you say natural rights. And he recognizes that as politically effective and, and he doesn't merely observe it, he, and he recognizes that sometimes it may be politically useful. Uh, um, Honora Neal, not Richie, Honora Neal makes clear why that might be a problem. <coughs> and sh what she says is that um, if you accept that some human rights talk is, natural rights talk is merely aspirational, then she would argue that um, if, if you're asserting rights for example, that, that, that don't oblige anyone in particular, and maybe that no one in particular could possibly meet them, then the implication is you're, what you're saying is that this, this claim is not a real claim. And I guess she thinks that it, 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 uh, it undermines and evacuates <coughs> the that's her, that's her criticism, not which which is not developed criticism. He, he observes that it does have political, political role. She's the one who tries to explain why she thinks that's a problem. It, 
she wants, she wants Rice talk to be strictly normative, not merely aspirational or rhetorical. I, I just uh, can we leave it there and then come back to maybe? But it seems to me part of the conflict here is that people are talking about different things. Yeah. And uh, if you take a traditional natural law, uh, at least my understanding of it would be, is that every law of denunciation of the law is teleological in the sense that it has a purpose behind it, and that rationale governs denunciation of the law. So what might appear to somebody like Ritchie as being a conditional thing, but it changes here and there is to misunderstand that the law itself is is geared to something, to say to nature, what, whatever, yeah. whatever that something is. And so therefore, uh, the law itself is not uh, conditioned, or it is conditioned in a sense towards going to the end. So it's absolute, it maintains its absolute, absoluteness, but its absoluteness is always rooted in its end. And so you may have a different situation, say, with the uh, discovery of the new world in the Salamanca School, with the, what they were looking at, and, and the world today. But it's always rooted in whatever, t whatever you take as, as the end of things. Now, there are those who obviously say there isn't any end of things. Uh, and you know, it's whatever, for instance, what, it's whatever is enacted, whatever positive like part would say, makes the distinction between being obliged and uh, being obliged and being obligated. Yeah. And we look at being obligated in the sense of the, like the moral duty, the deontological, what you should do, and obligated is being like being governed by the mafia, of being basically a hypothetical uh, force that's being placed upon you, that if you don't do this, yeah. you're gonna do that. Uh, law is punishment, all kinds of punishment. So I, I, in my understanding of the whole, like Richie, people are simply talking about different things. Yeah. And um, also, a lot of the people who are talking don't have a metaphysic behind their their ethical and juridical discussion. Yeah. And it's a lack of metaphysics. Obviously, you, you can't talk about natural law as the wicked as tradition would, unless you have some rooting in that, in that metaphysic. Yeah. Uh, okay. I, I, um, I don't have anything terribly sensible to say in response to that, except <laughs> that, I mean, you're right, people are talking about different things. Just to observe about Ritchie, um, he is a Hegelian, he has a very strong sense of, of, as it were, progress, and clearly there's some idea of, although you, you, know, you only find it implicitly, some idea of the watching and flourishing and social flourishing in particular amounts to. Um, um, but, he, but he is concerned about natural rights talk, as it were, ossifying a particular vision of what that requires here and now, so that when it, we meet in other situations, it becomes rigid. We, we can't, we, so, so we, it, it really a, a bit about imprudence. What, what makes sense here and now, even in terms of realizing, let's say, universal goods, does not make sense in quite the same way there and then. But I, just, uh, I, I'm sorry, yeah. But, uh, but uh, I would say so that the traditional knowledge or understanding that look makes allowance for that because it's, it's quieter. Yes, no, no, it's, I agree, it's, it's I agree. Yeah, they can argue with that. And that, can I just take one other point is that traditionally, the legal law, real law as obligation as opposed to being obliged is rooted in the moral law. Yeah. And so therefore, there has to be a, a, a continuity uh, there, which the positive is obviously would, yeah. would destroy. And I think that Richie may be working, or at least some of these, these uh, critique could be working from an understanding of a very positivistic view of the world. Can we, Nigel, can we take just one more? Sure. So who was next? <laughs> uh, uh, you, you, sorry, I'm sorry, fell in the back of your hand. Yeah. hand up. So, um, So, so the, sorry, I, the time I, I shortened that. So uh, I spent a lot of time talking about, about alleged rights to, to life or to property, and, and then there's also the issue of the right to liberty. Uh, but within the 
late medieval and early modern periods, it seems to me that there are two very clear, clearly distinct and in fact opposed, I think, traditions. Uh, one running from, from Cicero, let's, through the Renaissance to Hobbes, whereby um, originally um, um, man has, a, has an absolute natural right to liberty. Um, there is no moral law, and the use of the word right by Hobbes is quite misleading. It's not a moral thing at all, it's a compulsion for self-preservation. It's not moral. Uh, and this seems to me, t to, to a Christian of any moral realist, that's just not acceptable. Um, um, in the state of nature, outside of civil society, we are not free to do whatever we want. The moral law still applies. So there's that. Then the scholastics, um, including going up to Grotius in the 1600s, uh, have a different co concept that in the state of nature, um, um, uh, the natural law, and, and actually, contrary to some Straussians, uh, I think even Locke has a concept of, of natural law that, that qualifies and constrains what can be done in the state of nature, in a way that Hobbes Hop is not the case. Um, so quite, two quite different distribution, uh, traditions. Ritchie wasn't responding to Hobbes. He does mention him once, he mentions Locke once or twice. Um, but had he done so, I would say he would have been with, with the scholastics, not with, with Hobbes, because clearly he has, a, he has a notion that uh, uh, th th there are goods and there are moral principles. Yeah, I better stop there. Please help me thank Professor Knight.